I'm Eric Halivni, sitting with Mordechai Chertoff in Arnona, Jerusalem, September 13th, 2009. Why don't you tell me a little bit about your family life growing up, parents, siblings, where it was? All right. Uh, we started in, in Brooklyn, in Borough Park, and the days before it was a Hasidic Yishtibu. And uh, I went to the Shivat Eitz Chaim in Borough Park, as did my brother. My father was chairman of the board there, and the kids used to come to me and tell your father we want a vacation. Of course, it didn't work. And uh, I remember my mother was going to Hunter College, and uh, my sister was little then, it was before I was born, and mother brought her to the uh, kindergarten at the yeshiva, and she was there. At the end of the year, she comes home, she says, I've been promoted, and she stayed there for five years. The other parents were raising Cain. They wanted their daughters to come too, but it wasn't possible. So after five years, she had to leave, but that gave her a very good basis in Hebrew, and uh, she never lost it. Uh, give me an idea of what my father was like. He was teaching at the seminary then and it was an hour and a half by subway each way every day for him to go to teach because he wanted his kids to be in a grow up in a Jewish neighborhood and have access to a Jewish uh, school. And in those days, that's all there was. Uh, I think the whole approach with father would be you know, there's a Midrash that says, Biyom Shecharev Bet HaMikdash Nolad Mashiach. My father's reading was that the drive to go back to Jerusalem was born the day we were driven out. In other words, Zionism goes back to that period. And he was, he was committed to it. Um, we had a neighbor in, in Brooklyn, I remember, Fish, the name was, who made Aliyah back in the late 20s. And they wrote to my mother, the, the wife wrote to my mother and said, if you come to Palestine for a year, what you save in rent in New York will cover the costs of the whole year in transportation back and forth for the whole family. So in 1935, the summer. How old were you? When were you born? I was born in 22. Uh, last week I was I had a birthday, 87. We, uh, in 35, I had graduated from elementary school. My sister from high school, my brother from college. It was a logical time, so we came to Palestine. Uh, I had an early bar mitzvah because father couldn't come with us. He didn't get leave from the seminary until... Uh, April 36, and I still remember the way my bar mitzvah speech began. Rabotai, zechut gedola amdali, shebaod shvot achadim heni ole atzai Yisrael. And of course, every kid in the yeshiv was sitting there waiting for me to make a mistake. It didn't happen, but you know, kids. So we came here, 
And uh, of course, the Jerusalem. My mother had an aunt, or a, a relative, Aunt Gittel, who lived in Meir Sharim. And I will never forget, I was this big, and I had to sleep on top of a trunk that had wooden strips across the top. So I don't think we lasted a week there. The first place we could find was an apartment on the outskirts of the city, Rehov Tzvanya Shivim, in Kerem Avraham, which in those days was still not uh, what it is today. And we were the last house. After us, it was hills and mountains. I remember the, uh, my mother touched the wall and some of the plaster came off on her hand. So she grabbed the watchman, because we were the only people in the building at that point. And she said, you, you tell the, the owner that that's not finished. She says, tov, tov, ania jidlo, ania jidlo. But that was the end of it. Nothing ever happened. And uh, I remember they hooked it up. The very first thing, some guy came in, put a shelf up near the, uh, in the hall with an alarm clock on it that had a string attached to a, a switch for Shabbat. You set the alarm clock. When it went off, the, the uh, string would tighten up and turn off the electricity. Of course, there were some days that were so cold in there that we, we played handball to warm up. But it was a, uh, it was a great, it was a great change and the view was gorgeous. We could see uh, Nebi Samuel from the from the balcony. And about a hundred years later, when I came with my wife, I took her to Kerem Avraham and I showed her where we lived. And you could still see the bullet hole in the tris from the riots in 36. I have a picture of it somewhere. Anyway, I went to uh, my brother went to the university just to have something to do. You, you were here, it was the four of you, your mother and the three... And the three kids, three kids, yeah. And your father was still in... He was still in the States. And when you came, the plan was to stay for... For a year. For a year. Yeah. So my brother went to the university just to have something to do. And my sister went to school to the gymnasia in uh, Beta Kerem. And I went to Beit Midrash Lemurim Mizrahi on Rehov Hillel in Jerusalem. It was then across the street, rather it was across the street from what was then the Aden Hotel. That's now a Misrat Klita. I remember coming in with my mother, and he said, oh, an American, well, you'll need a tutor for, for a, a, a Gemara. I said, no way, and I walked out. I went to Tachkimoni. I was there for a week, it was a Beatlesman. So I went to my father's friend, Mayor Berlin, and I told him the story, and he called Lipschitz, who was the principal at uh, the Beit Midrash Lemurim, and he gave it to him. And he told him, you will take him, and after a month or two, if he needs a tutor, then he'll get one. And that was the end of it. I went, and I didn't need a tutor, and uh, now it irks me when I go to the Cafe Hillel, where I go frequently, and I look across the street, instead of Bet Midrash Lamurim Mizrahi, it's called Kolel Lifshitz. The name just, but uh, it's ancient history. 
my sister had a... Mayor Berlin was a friend of your father's. My father's, father's from New York. The, uh, my sister had a teacher in Beta Kerem. Um, by the name of Malkov. And when I came back in 1946, and I started working at the Post, I got a call from Yoel Malkov. He said, I'll meet you at the Atara. Allah Shalom, it's gone now. It's now a Burger King or something. So we met. And of course, there were always CID there, because they hoped they're going to catch somebody, you know. And you could always spot them by the haircuts, the straight line across the back, even if they didn't say a word. So we schmoozed for a while, and then at one point he said to me, go to Kupat Cholim. I said to him, what do I need Kupat Cholim? I'm young, I'm strong, I'm healthy, I don't need any. He said, you'll go to Kupat Cholim and ask for Yechezkel. Oh, it, it's, it, it penetrated. So I went, and uh, I asked for Yechezkel. Oh, Hashem Bifnim. I go in, the first question I had was, do you drive a car? I said, I'm a New, I'm a New Yorker, of course not. Uh, do you want to be with the Palestinians, in those days we were the Palestinians, or the Americans. I said, Americans, Afpam Lo. Okay, Beseda. They took me back, I was sworn into the Haganah, and uh, walking to the office from there, I didn't suspect, I knew that here it said Haganah. <laughs> Anybody would be able to tell. <laughs> And uh, that started that whole period. Well, let's take a, a step back for a second. So you, you were spending that year here in, in 35, 36. Yeah. And you were in the Beit Midrash. Uh, yeah. And was the, the riots broke out while you were here? Oh, yeah. The riots broke out in early 36. My father had just arrived with uh, an aunt, my mother's sister, one of my mother's sisters, who after the first few shots went off said, I'm getting out of this burg. But of course we didn't leave until the summer. And, you know, I was enough of a kid in those days. I didn't want to schlep with my mother, but she dragged me to the Eden Hotel to meet Henrietta Zold. Now I'm glad I met her, you know. And uh, we schlepped up to Kfar Giladi. I don't know why, but I remember we spent at least a week there, maybe 10 days, and I went up to uh, Tel Chai, and I have a picture of myself on the statue to Trumpeldor, and uh, I remember riding in a, a wagon going down to the field to harvest and standing there and, you know, just absolutely delirious. It was so different from anything I'd ever done before. Then in, in 30, uh, summer of 36, we went back to the States and I went to uh, the uh, Yeshiva High School. Yeshavat Reb Yitzchak Elchanan High School, and it was it was a steal. It was so easy, and I discovered very quickly that my Hebrew teacher <coughs> wanted desperately to go to Palestine, but his wife was sick and he couldn't. His name was Sawyer. He had three sons who were artists. And of course, knowing that, I geared my compositions to it. Leil Zvaot Babet Alpha. 
התקפה על השיירה. And a few others like that. So my Hebrew, the, the, my grades for those compositions were 95, 96, 99, 99. I mean, I couldn't lose. But it was obviously such a waste of time that uh, one day I came home, I said to my father, I must speak. I, I, I'm just wasting time there. He said, so what do you want to do? I said, I thought Stuyvesant High School. He said, okay. My sister was ready to go into mourning. He's going to be a guy. He's, he's leaving everything. My father said, don't worry about him. So I went to uh, Stuyvesant. <laughs> I still remember at one point I joined the fencing team and I brought home uh, foils, weapons. My father looks at it, he says, Asaph, <laughs> but he didn't say you mustn't do it. Our competitions were always on Shabbat. So not to embarrass my father, and I used to walk from 98th Street and West End Avenue down to 17th Street on the east side to Stuyvesant. I didn't use my name. Instead of Chertov, I was Sherman. I mean, when I think back now, I can't picture uh, a Lieberman or Finkelstein or Rachel Ginsburg looking at the fencing scores and, and recognizing a name. But uh, uh, so I did that. And then from there, I went to uh, CCNY where uh, I got a degree in a bachelor's degree in uh, social sciences which of course is not science, it's, uh, you know. And uh, while I was there, I took courses at the seminary. But I remember there was one class with Mordecai Kaplan's daughter, a music class. My sister and I were in the class together. It was in the evening. And one day she was describing something and she said, well, she said, I can play it on the piano, but I really need somebody to accompany me on the violin. So my sister raises her hand and says, why don't you ask Mordecai? And she says to him, Mordecai, will you come? I said, I can't play violin. And my sister said, oh, he's just being coy. I could have killed her. But finally I, I convinced Kaplan that I was not the violinist and that, that was the end of that. But I remember when I applied to the seminary, my father said, it's, it's a good education. He said, but don't be a rabbi. One in the family is enough, meaning my brother. They asked me in the interview, why do you want to be a rabbi? And I didn't hear what I was saying, and they didn't hear what I was saying. I said, well, I thought it'd be nice to go into my father's business. They all laughed, they thought that was real cute. The end of the story is that uh, my father died in January of 66. In June of 66, I was back in New York looking for a job. I went to one of these headhunters. I'll never forget this. And she said to me, given your druthers, what would you like to be? I said, I'd like to be a great cellist. She said, oh, you play cello. I said, no, but given my druthers, that's what I would like. I had just heard Pablo Casals, and I was so, I loved the sound of the cello anyway. Anyway, I, uh, I went to the World Zionist Organization, and I started, um, well, the first project I did there was to organize some a year study in, in uh, Israel for American students. 
I got a deal with the Chancellor of Schools in New York, and uh, the first group I brought came to uh, Kfar Bloom, and there was another group later that went to uh, one of the one of the other. I don't remember now. And uh, I remember one one year I brought a group. My kids and my then wife had come. Uh, we'd arranged that I wanted to show them around Israel and everything. So they were here already. We get to Tel Aviv with the, with a group that I was bringing. Oh, <laughs> we were late getting to uh, Paris where we had to change flights. And I told the kids, you can go out for a couple of hours, but leave your passports here. I come back later. Oh, we, we get out to the airport the following morning. I said, okay, dig out your passports. One idiot, I left it in the hotel. You said, don't take it, leave it here. So they had to send a taxi from the hotel with the passport to the airport. Anyway, uh, I get to Ben Gurion, and I'm getting the kids organized and having them. They were being picked up from the from the schools, and suddenly I I hear a voice. Dad, my son. They came. <clears throat> they came to the airport to meet me. I had to wait until we got rid of the kids. It was very nice. Uh, so when you, you finished City College, you started the seminary. Yeah. And did you, conti you continued in the seminary for? Uh, uh, for three years. Then at one point, I decided I had enough. Moshe Davis was then the dean. I went to him and I said, look, I want to go to Israel for a while, to Palestine. He said, what are you going to tell the faculty here? They'll tell you that man for man, we have a better faculty than anything you can get in Israel. So and, uh, uh, finally I said, look, Avira de Eretz Israel Machim. Oh, okay, he said. And they said, okay, they gave me uh, leave to go. I graduated in absentia the summer of June of uh, 47. But I was here and I was committed and I wasn't going to move. So when did you, you had, you had been here 35, 36. Yeah. And then uh, now you've gone, finished school, etc. And then I came back in 46. Came back in 46. Yeah. Uh, I went to see Gershon Agronsky, Agron later, at the Post. I had a letter from Maya Weisgall, who was or had been a great friend of uh, Weizmann. And Weisgall, I remember he called Weizmann in London. He said, Chaim, you have to come. You'll make him raise a million dollars. I guarantee it. So finally, Weitzman gave in, and he went to the States, and he raised well above a million. But I had been tutoring uh, Weisgall's daughter in Hebrew. So he gave me a letter for Ogransky. I handed it to Ogransky. He says, hmm, Weisgall, mayor says nice things about you. He said, but I'll take you anyway. So I started working at the Post. Did you have writing or journalism experience at all, or is this something that you just... Uh... I was the editor of the Hillel News in college. You know, and nothing, nothing serious, nothing real. But it wasn't a problem. And uh, I still remember, we landed in Haifa, from the Marine Corp, known as the Marine Crap. It was a barely reconstituted 
a troop ship. And I remember there were a bunch of Arabs on board who were sick from minute one, not day one. They never got out of bed for two weeks. And we learned very quickly what it was going to be like. So we piled all of our luggage up in one place and we had a toranut. Each one of us had to take an hour or two hours. The rest of us slept up on deck. It was impossible to be down below. We get to Haifa and uh, we're waiting, we're waiting, nothing is happening. Some guy comes on board. He says, Efoa uh, Hevra. He says, he says, okay, they stay there until 12 o'clock. He says, 12 o'clock, the Englishman on duty goes off, and an Arab comes on, and he's, uh, he's in our pocket. 12 o'clock, the boys come up, dressed in khaki shorts and khaki shirts, and they just came to see some people off. We got off the boat. And uh, there was no problem. Well, what were you what were you concerned about? Uh, the British not letting us in. We had a few a few of us had visas. I had a visa. The theory was that I was going to study at the Hebrew University, and I had to pay a, a semester tuition to get the visa. And there were half a dozen of us who had it. So we took the luggage of the other guys. We went ashore as though they were welcoming us. As soon as we got out of the port, they went to Yagur. And the other, the rest of us, half a dozen, took a bus, Eged, into Jerusalem, where uh, I had a contact, somebody had arranged for me, and I had a room in Rechavia. That was Thursday. I'll never forget the sequence. Shabbat afternoon, I went to visit Sharet, then Shertok. The legend was that we were related. I say legend because years later, it became obvious that there was no family relationship at all. But he always acted as though there was. So we're sitting around Shabbat afternoon, there's a, a lot of people there, and some woman says uh, she wants to tell a story, a joke, but it has to be in English. She, Does everybody understand English? Can Kulame bin Amanglit? Okay. She tells the story, she all, we all laugh. She turns to me and she says, Me'ain l'cha Anglit? said, Ani Amerikai. She said, oh, as matahi garta arza. said, biyom b'chamishi. So she looks at me, me'ayin l'cha ivrit. Kibalti zrikot. Well, Sharet howled, he thought that was. But uh, that was the beginning of my. And then uh, I was at the post. You started at the post in what capacity? Just uh... a reporter. And uh, actually rewrite. There's some reporting, but uh, <clears throat> it was a very loose organization in those days. At one point, Gronsky calls me in. He says, Weston, was it Monty Weston? No, I forgot the first name. Weston's going to Paris. He's going to have a one-man art show. He was the foreign, the foreign news editor. He said, you're taking his spot. You have three nights. First night you watch him, second night he watches you, the third night you're on your own. Okay. So, uh, and part of the job was doing the headlines for the Post. One day, one of these 
wise guy reporters <clears throat> was going to uh, to Lud and to the airport to meet somebody. So he writes a story about it, and it begins. Under a hail of bullets, your reporter went to Litter, Litter Airport. I said, okay, I'm going to fix him. I, his story came in on the AP. I printed his story in one column. Next to it, I put the story of what happened. There was one shot fired. One. So he comes storming in. They used to come in every night and look at the galleys, you know, to take stories. He says, you're making me look like a fool. I said, you did it. It's your story. I said, you want it? I can't take it out. It's in. You want to get rid of it? Talk to Ogronsky. <laughs> he went to Ogronsky, who threw him out uh, for good reason. And uh, I, I really enjoyed that, that period of, on the post. Um, we had David Courtney did column one. His name was really, I uh, late said the book. Was it Davidson? He had been in British intelligence during the war, and he was posted here. And when it was over, he decided to stay. Roy Elston was his original name. Yeah. I remember that because he wrote a book called uh, No Alternative about that whole period. And he leaves out the bombing of the post and the fact that he wrote a regular column for the Post. Obviously, he didn't want to his pro-Israel stuff to be too slanted. But he was, he was a terrific guy. When was the bombing of the Post? February 1st, 1948. I will never forget. I was... It was a Sunday night, which is always slow. And I was sitting at my desk in the press room, reading Moby Dick, the fourth or fifth time. And when, when the explosion went off, the book took a fragment. It would have hit me otherwise. Marlon Levin, who uh, was a reporter then, I'll tell you about him in a minute, uh, was not sitting in his, at, his regular, at his desk. Monty Jacobs had gone to Tel Aviv. So Marlon moved into Monty's spot, fortunately for him, because a piece of metal from the window came flying across where Marlon would have been sitting, would have taken his head off. He came to Palestine in 47. I don't remember exactly when, but according to him, I met him and his wife. He had just been discharged from the army, newly married. And he says, I met them on Jaffa Road. Now, what could I possibly have been doing on Jaffa Road? I have no idea because I went from the Atara to the, to the post, up uh, what is now Chavat Selet. It used to be called Rehov uh, no, not Hillel. Hasolel. I don't know why they changed it. But uh, I knew his wife from New York. She had been a student at the seminary at the Teachers Institute. So we talked and uh, I said, well, what are you planning to do here? He said, oh, I thought uh, journalism. He had done some journalism in the States. I said, oh, good, come on. 
I schlepped him up to the post, introduced him to Ogronsky, and he had a job. I couldn't lose. And uh, he's still here. He's living in a Diyun Mugan in, uh, in Betakarim. I'll give you his, his phone number. When, when did you become foreign news editor? When was that? I don't remember the date. It was sometime in uh, late 47. Did you cover um, like the uh, uh, UN Special Committee on Palestine? Of course. Exodus? Uh... Exodus, no, but the UNSCAP, yes. Tell me about that a little bit. And uh, I remember going with them. We went down to the Negev. And they were such a nasty bunch. You know, we got to uh, around Ein Gedi, and there was one place where, the, where, where they had created a big uh, brecha. And I, and I said to one of them, look at this, it's incredible what they, he said, ah, it's ridiculous, it'll all dry up and uh, they'll have to leave. The big moment with Unscop was Weitzman. They were meeting at the YMCA in, in Jerusalem, here in Jerusalem. And Abba Iban and a few others ground out Weitzman's speech. Since his eyesight then was already failing, we printed it in inch high letters. We made copies, distributed to the press, and Weitzman walks in. Even the Indian, who was a nasty anti-Semit, stood up. There was a charisma about this guy that was unbelievable. He walks up to the stage, looks at the papers, they had put his speech there, sweeps it off onto the floor, and begins to speak. Well, the reporters went crazy. He's ad living. He's ad -libbing. I said, you know, reporters are supposed to report, not get everything fed to them. So they had to take notes, and uh, he he was absolutely superb. But that was Weitzman, and. Uh, I covered that. I covered uh, uh, some stuff in the old city, the attack on the old city, and the. Uh, it, I have some of it written down. I'll give it to you. How about the UN vote? UN vote. I was at the post. I, it was supposed to be Friday night. But it wasn't. I remember I was friendly with Yaakov Herzog, the youngest son of, uh, of Chief Rabbi Herzog. In fact, uh, he borrowed a book from me. I don't even remember what it was, but I said on condition that I borrow one from you because I knew I'd never get it back. So I still have the book he gave me. It was uh, some Churchill stuff. Anyway, I stopped off there on the way to the office. And uh, they started, this was Saturday night. So somebody explained it can't be Friday night, because En Mashiach Babi Shabbat. So, I remember they went through the vote. And we were keeping score on, on a radio in, in the office. And there was a young woman with me from uh, Cleveland. Her name was Ann Strauss. I'll tell you about her. Um, we're keeping score, and at one point, we made it. 
there was an uproar. Everybody ran out of the building. They were dancing in the streets. Even the British, British soldiers anyway. Uh, I remember one of them came by in a tank, picked up some kids, take them on a ride around. Um, after a while, we got back to the office and we had to put out a paper. So we did. Once the paper was printed, we joined the crowds outdoors. And that's where I have a picture of myself on the roof of the uh, Sokhrut building. I don't know how I got there. I mean, I don't remember going up, but I remember the place was jammed. We were waiting for Golda. And she showed up, and uh, I don't remember the speech now, I probably, uh, I wrote it up for the post, but, uh, and then things started. That's when the shooting started. The very next day, all over, I mean, uh, in Jerusalem and uh, around Tel Aviv and Jaffa and uh, up north, uh, So then uh, after, oh, I was going to tell you about Anne Strauss. She had a bachur who was a kibbutznik in Malea Hamisha. She came from a wealthy Cleveland family. I mean, that's, that's a, a zug that's really difficult to conceive. I had a crush on her, but I never got anywhere. And this was after what happened. She had gone to visit him in Malaya Hamisha. It was during the siege. And he had Chofesh, so he was able to go into town, back to town with her. And they went in a uh, convoy of uh, supply trucks, you know, with food, and they sat on barrels in the body of the truck. And at one point, there was a uh, an ambush. Their truck went off the road into a ditch, and uh, he knocked her. Her chaver knocked her down to the floor of the truck and stretched out on top of her. He absorbed all the bullets. She was drenched in his blood when the Haganah finally drove the Arabs off. She didn't know until the next day that he'd been killed. They gave her a sedative and they took her to the hospital. Um, I knew the story. I didn't have the heart to write it up. I wrote it and I put it aside. Then uh, the end of the summer, I think the summer of 49, and things had quieted down, she went back home to uh, Cleveland. On the way, she stopped in New York, she called my parents. In, in uh, Cleveland, somehow one of these coincidences, my sister was living there then. So she called my sister, and my sister came to a big family reunion they had. And Abba Hill Silver was there. So, of course, she met Silver. And Silver said, oh, yes, your brother, she said. He says, I met him in Jerusalem. Oh, he's doing a fantastic job. I mean, typical rabbinic baloney. We had met, and that was it, you know. Uh, Anne introduced me to him. Then uh, she came back to Israel uh, some years later and she married. She married Yisrael uh, Shenkar, you know, from the 
the the um, Collins, the textile. Uh... Yeah, the textile family, and I I didn't know anything about it. I got a on one of my visits here. My friend uh, Ray Sussman tells me that she's married. I said, "Well, let's go visit." They were living in Givatayim, so we went, and it was heartbreaking. She'd had a stroke, and her memory was bad. She told him, "I uh, I remember Morty, but I I won't. I don't think I'll recognize him." We came. We came. And I had, by then, I had written up the story and included in my uh, memoirs. And he, they had read that part of it to her. So we get there, we sat and we talked for a while. And uh, finally, when we left, I said to her, Anne, I still love you. And she said, I love you too. The next day, she calls me in Tel Aviv. She said, the name you have for my bachur from Baleh Hamisha is half right. I said, what do you mean half right? She said, his first name was Alter. The second name was whatever it was. So I made the correction. And, but uh, she was, back in, in 48, 49, she was Yasky's uh, gopher, uh, Dr. Yasky. And she would have been on that uh, Shayara that went up to the Hebrew University and was slaughtered. But she was in the Haganah too, and she was a map reader. And they wouldn't let her go. They said, you have to stay in town. That saved her life. It's, uh, I mean, you never know how these things are going to work. I have some pictures of her from those days. I also have <laughs> a picture of a Temaniya by the name of Leah. I'll never forget. She was a beautiful young woman. And when she saw I was getting serious, she said, Mordechai, Zaloyalech. I said, Lama, my age. She said, I'm Mishpacha Shali, Af Pam Lot Tekabel Shikinazi. Is that the end of the story? <laughs> but uh, I was, I was in the Haganah here. And, you know, some of the things we did were silly. I mean, uh, they taught us how to uh, hitch up hoses and uh, put them back on the truck until one day somebody realized there's no water in the, in the system anyway. What's the point? So we stopped with that. I wanted to ask you something more about the post uh, before. Yeah. Uh, actually, a couple of questions. One, do you what what happened the when the post was bombed about getting out a newspaper? Was there uh, every journalist in town came with a typewriter? We rewrote the paper from memory. Oh, you had already uh, two pages. The Yes, it, it was about 10 o'clock at night where it was mostly made up. Wait a second, I'll show you a, uh, I have a... Probably on tape. Yeah, that's right. It was only two sides. And the, uh, the heading of course, uh, was just set up for this issue. I have the original. I found it later. And there's a, David one, a column one by David Courtney about the, the bombing. It was... Uh, Wait, so how'd you get the paper out? You... We went to Lipschitz Press, and all the newspaper guys met us there. 
and uh, we did it. And I remember after the bombing, uh, I had been running a, a spy group called the Yedidim, British. One was uh, an Irishman. He looked like a stage Irishman. Freckles, red hair, turned up nose. And when I told him what we wanted him to do, which was to, to post um, uh, notices and stories around the old city, he, he looked at me with a big grin ear to ear and he says, Sure now, and that's the way I began in the IRA. <laughs> and uh, there were a couple of other uh, Brits there in it. And I remember when the bomb went off, one of, the, one of them came driving up Hasolel Street. He wanted to see how I am. Did I, am I okay? I was okay, and that was, so it was fine. Um, I have... Uh... Before I want to, I want to hear more about the spy group in a second. But when, when the paper, when the when the post was bombed, yeah, did you think, oh, we need to get the paper out? We need did you think about that? How did you know? My you know was my first reaction was to get to the post office and send a telegram that I'm okay. But nothing was going out. My brother was supposed to meet with a group of Methodists in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And uh, he knew that there had been a bombing. And he was waiting to hear from, from, from Jerusalem what, who was hurt. So we got hold of one of the correspondents. Uh, there was Ernie Stock was here. He was also on the post. He had a metal plate in his head from a wound in the, in the Second World War. And we got one of the newspaper men wired back to the States uh, that Chertoff and Stock are fine. And my brother got that message before he went out to make his speech. He told them, and there was a great reception for it. Um, yeah, so when I came, I came back from the, the, this, this futile trip to the post office, I went, of course, I went to the Atara, which was staying open all night. And uh, Ted Lurie and his wife were there. And I, I with her, I'd gone back a, a long uh, history of flirtation. So she gave me some coffee and a kiss and said, now, here's where you go. We're trying to put out the paper. So I went and uh, we put it out. Going home, it was about... Uh, five, six o'clock in the morning, I had to walk past the Sochnut. I get there and I, I said, to, there was a guy outside on duty, I said, call Carmi. There was an American, the Carmi Charney, who later changed his name to Tet Carmi, the poet. We shared a room, an apartment. So he comes out, he sees me, ah, he said, we heard a hundred people had been killed. I said, no, there was one at the time, one or two, there was one guy who disappeared. We discovered later that he walked home barefoot in shock, but they got home safely. The linotyper I would have been standing with at the time, but it was a Sunday and they were, the paper, you know, the news is very slow. We always had something on China, you know. And, uh, 
he was hit by the flying lead, uh, flying brass rather, from the linotype machine, and he was blinded. And uh, a couple of months later, he died. But I remember going in, going downstairs, and I called out, and he said, Mordechai, kachotilo magin David. And there was a, actually there was a Hadassah uh, office or branch or something right across on Hatzolel Street. So we took him there on a door. And uh, it was, it was a t really a terrible day. And then it wasn't too long after that, we had the, uh, the bombing on the Ben Yehuda Street, where one of my friends from the States, uh, who was training to be a, a nurse, just set up business. She took a lipstick, put the Magen David on, on a, a wall someplace, and she started treating, uh, dealing with, with wounded people. I had met her one day on the street. Uh, it had to be before Pesach. And uh, I, I said to her, what are you doing? She said, oh, nothing much. And she, I say it had to be before Pesach, but she had a box, box of matzah. And she, she went on. It must have been a week later. My Mfaked takes me with him to Schneller. I don't know why, but uh, we went. And uh, we walk into the decoding room. And there's uh, Tzipi sitting there. She sees me. She jumps up. She says, oh. <laughs> Obviously, I was. Tzipi? Hmm? What Tzipi? Uh, it's now Parat. It was then uh, Tzipi Borovsky. Mm -hmm. uh, her father was, I don't have to tell you. We, she was our, one of our, she was the second interview that we did. Hmm? She was the interview number two out of, uh, in our program. Ah, you got Tzipi. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you, she made a living out of her letters from Jerusalem. Yeah. And uh, I met he, the first edition was edited by Ruth Seligman. The second edition, Ruth Seligman doesn't exist anymore. She disappeared. And uh, Chippy managed to promote a translation of the letters into Hebrew. Uh, Malesh, you know, each one has his own. Uh, uh, Ruth wasn't here. She came after it was all over. She came with her husband, who was uh, Orthodox. And uh, one day she told me, <laughs> after he died, she suddenly had an epiphany. He's not here. She doesn't have to be Orthodox anymore. I'd, I had not known that she was at a camp called Tel Noor, which was a Zionist camp. I think it was two weeks up in the, in the sticks someplace. She was there the summer I was there. I was the, uh, supposed to be the athletics director. And Herzl Fishman was the, uh, the cultural director. And he used to, he had a kind of strange approach to things. And when he was through with the kids, they'd come to me, what the hell is he talking about? So I would take them out in boats and we'd tie the boats together at the prow and I would uh, teach them Zionism which is supposed to be his job. And there was a guy there who was a chazan 
in a shul up in, uh, uh, in New England someplace, I forgot where. And we used to go out in the boat and I would sing the old Israeli songs for him. And he would simply take down, not just the lyrics, but the notes. He was incredible how he remembered everything, how he handled it. I can't think of his name now, but the librarian at HUC in New York knew him as a chazan in a synagogue. So. Take a break to switch the tapes. You mentioned before that you were running a spy group. Yeah. Yeah. Hayedidim. It was. Uh, they had a few uh, British soldiers. Uh, one this this Irish kid, and from time to time they would get some information for us about what the Brits were doing, what some of the Arabs were doing. This is when you were at the Post? Yeah, yeah. You, were you, you weren't in the Haganah yet? Yeah, sure. Oh, oh sure. Okay. So, sure. why don't we take a step back, tell me when you joined the Haganah, and how... Uh, well, Haganah was uh, early 47. And... Uh, The Yedidim started, see, they, part of it was that they, were, they traveled all over the country. I mean, they, they knew what was going on in various places. There was a guy, <coughs> a reporter for the uh, uh, UP, uh, Elyav Simon. He was a strange guy. His brother had been the correspondent. And his brother went swimming in Tel Aviv, in the beach, and he drowned. There was no, it, would, it, it was uh, not terrorism related or anything. It was an accident. It happened. His name was John. So without notifying the office in New York, Elyav took over. It was months before they realized that he was not John uh, Simon anymore. <laughs> so uh, John used to take members of, uh, of Haganah or of Eitzel or even of Lehi. They had to go someplace, he would take them in his car. He had press clearance that made it easier for him. I mean, I had that kind of press clearance in, in Jerusalem. I remember once going to the, what we used to call Bevingrad, you know, where the, the British headquarters were, the, the Russian compound. I could walk right in, show my press card, which I did, and I walked around and I made notes of where everything was. And then I came out and turned it over to my fuckhead where the gun emplacements are, where the posts are. When the British finally left, it was all organized. One of them walked out on the balcony of one of the buildings there and blew his nose in a handkerchief. That was the signal they're pulling out. Our Hevra swung in over the, uh, through the trees, over the wall, into the, uh, the compound. By the time the Arabs got there, we had taken it over completely. So, well, then, uh, uh, oh, I saw I went for training in uh, what was then Ramat Rachel. And this Milt Shulman said, to who, a real soldier said to me, if you don't have to run, you walk. If you don't have to walk, you stand. If you don't have to stand, you sit. If you don't have to sit, you lie down. 
which we did, waiting for the training to begin. The other guys were running around all excited. By the time we started, they were exhausted and we were fresh as daisies. I learned from the right guy. Well, at one point, uh, my Faked said to me, uh, you go to Latrun. I forgot who was the Faked there and tell so-and-so he needs you. That was a transfer. But before that, I had a week Chufsha. So I went down to Tel Aviv where uh, Carmi was then posted. <laughs> he was a debriefer with the Air Force, but the Air Force didn't have any planes then, so he had nothing to do. He sees me, he says, uh, hmm, I'm taking you for a, a black market meat lunch. I said, ma pitom. He says, don't you ever look in the mirror? He said, you're yellow. You've got jaundice. Your eyes are yellow. Your skin is yellow. Don't you itch? I said, now that you mention it, I'm itching. But I didn't before. So we had a meal. I went to the uh, Ktsin Ha'ir. He said, oh, yeah, you better go to Telefinsky. I said, how do I get there? Tremp. So I went, and I was in a ward with, there were 40 of us. Uh, there were only two of us who had joined us. The others had other things. There was a guy there who was an expert on everything. He read the newspapers. So I said, I'm a newspaper man. Oh, okay. So then I was the expert. But you know, you have to be so careful. We were sitting around one day outside in the shade and uh, I see a family coming to visit one of our chabra. And there was a young girl with him, but she was... not the American ideal. She was big, heavy. And I don't know the Kodesh Baruch Hu must have been watching. I kept my mouth shut. She turned out to be the girlfriend of one of the patients. Sfaradim. From a community where if you were heavy, it meant you came from a wealthy family. You didn't have to work. And if you were pale, you also you didn't have to work. And she was both. So, I, fortunately, as I say, I kept my mouth shut. Then, after two weeks, uh, they said, okay, you, can, you don't have to stay any longer. You can go down to uh, a rehab in Rehovot. So, the two of us went down. Uh, the other guy had been shot up. But his stomach, the outside, had healed, so he thought he was finished. And uh, after a few days hanging around Rehovot, and we went to a movie, and he said, must be, I, he has to go back into the army. And he went. I was waiting to be reassigned. The job at Latrun was finished. Somebody else had taken it. What was your job? In it was supposed to be a Ktsin Kesher or something. I get up to Tel Aviv. Oh, we got just a job for you. There's going to be a new publication in English for the Anglo Saxon. Frontline. Harold Schifrin is going to be the editor. You can be his reporter. I said, fine. I meet Schifrin the next day. He says, look, I can't do this. He said, you do it. You'll be the editor. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. So I was the editor. I put out nine issues. And unfortunately, 
they were in one of the cartons that never got here from the States, from the lift. I had 99 cartons, three didn't make it. There was that, uh, some of the zikronot uh, uh, that I had been writing, but that's all right because I had it on the computer anyway. But I took it to Haaretz Press in, in Tel Aviv. And my Mfake tells me, you're up for a court martial. I said, ma piton. He says, who told you to take it to Haaretz? He said, nobody told me not to. He said, every other foreign language publication is being mimeographed. No. Nope. Fortunately, Ben-Gurion saw it. And he said, just the thing for the Anglo-Saxon. So I was off the hook. It was all right. Uh, then uh, at one point, you know, things were very lax then. I mean, in terms of uh, spit and polish and uh, paperwork, uh, there was a new newspaper called Hador. And they uh, invited me to be their correspondent in New York. So I thought, ah, good deal. I'll go back, I'll see the folks. I'll, uh... Fortunately, I stayed with my parents in New York. And I, I covered the UN for them, and I, I still have some of the clippings from... I get back, and... Uh... They were supposed to de deposit my salary at Barclays Bank here in, in town. Lo du bim yar, not a penny. They went bankrupt while I was in, in New York. <laughs> so all I got from them was a few headlines. <laughs> then uh, I was around for a while. I had. I started working for the uh, PEF, the Palestine, uh, yeah. By then it was called the Israel PEF. And uh, I was taking some artist woman around Jaffa. And at one point she said, well, why don't you do something? I said, I never did. She said, try it. So I did. That's the, uh, the watercolor <laughs> I did. <laughs> And uh, then the summer, I left. What year is this? Uh, 1950. I had met uh, the woman who became the father of, uh, the mother of my son and daughter. And uh, she was uh, a Brit. And we were married in London. And it lasted uh, 25 years. And then... Uh, we broke up, and uh, a little later I remarried, and uh, my wife died. First day of Sukkot, 04. And uh, everybody came to the funeral. I mean, my son and came from here with his wife. My daughter came down from New Hampshire, and uh, the whole our whole congregation in New York came. Our last year, year and a half, she was suffering from Alzheimer's. But the amazing thing was, to the very end, she could go through the beginning of the Amida, right through Kedusha by heart. She never lost it. And uh, in those days, for 30 years I did uh, Mafter Yona. She always sat there and listened, never missed a word. And the last time she was there with the shul president on one side and a, a woman about her age on the other side, taking it all in. 
and four days later she was gone. So, but uh, we had 26, 27 wonderful years. That's a picture of her done by an artist in New York whose wife had conniption fits. It took a year to do it, and she was afraid she was going to lose her husband. <laughs> it didn't happen. But uh, that was it. Um, going back, tell me about uh, when, when the state was declared. And uh, you were, were, you co were you covering it for the paper, or were you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was in Jerusalem, the, the big shindig was in Tel Aviv, and the big celebration was in Tel Aviv. But in Jerusalem it was a much quieter celebration because we were uh, under siege, and uh, it was a very dangerous time here. We, we got out a good newspaper, but uh, it, was, uh, it was not a lively day here. People were too worried. I remember one, at one point, the state had been declared And Azaria Rappaport was a correspondent in Jerusalem for our Haaretz. He and I decided we're going to Israel. That is, to where the state was. So we, uh, we hitched a ride. We got to... Uh, Kiryat Anavim. From there, we hitched another ride to the Latrun area, and uh, we started cr crossing. We thought we'd get to the Israel, what was really the Israel side of the, and we blundered into uh, an ambush. So we hit the dirt. When the moon was covered, by the clouds, we'd get up and run, and when the moon was uncovered, we'd hit down. Problem was, I had on a pair of Australian army pants, and the belt wouldn't go through the the uh, the trouser loops. So whenever I crawled, the pants would stay behind, and I'd have to pull them back up again. But uh, we finally got across, so we we. There was a, uh, a jeep picked us up, and we got down to Tel Aviv. And we were filthy. We walked into a shop, and we, we wanted to buy khakis, pants, tops. He says, Mef or Batem? He says, Mirushalayim. He says, Ech, he got the Altasap roof. And he outfitted us, no charge, <laughs> and we went into, went into town. I remember I stayed with, at the hotel that this family had in Jerusalem, in, uh, in Tel Aviv, that I'd moved from Borough Park. I slept in the hall, so I had to be up six o'clock in the morning because people were going through. And uh, while I was there, I did some stories for the Post. I turned them into the office in Tel Aviv, which somehow got them to Jerusalem. And then finally, I thought it was time to go back to Jerusalem. So I went to uh, the, the office there in Tel Aviv. They gave me a bunch of letters to take. And then I went to uh, a shop to buy some cigarettes for the Chavrin uh, at the Kiryat Anavim. 
so I asked for cigarettes, he hands me a pack. I said, no, 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 I need to a carton chalem. He said, I need to say Yerushalayim, and he said, Yerushalayim, tfaddal. He gave me a cart, take it with me. So I took it, I got to Kiryat Anavim, and Carmi was still there then. I remember I have a picture of him like this, sleeping. I gave him cigarettes, I, I gave it to the Hebra there. Then I got into Jerusalem. In those days, there was shelling right around the city. So I, call, I got home. I called Agronsky. I said, I'm back. He said, well, just come into the office, tell your story, and you don't have to work today. I thought to myself, he's got to be crazy. Come into the office of that shelling? So I called Ann Strauss. She said, uh, oh, it's all right, I'll go with you. She said, I know the routine. So she came over and we went. And it was really very simple. They, they bombed in a circle. You knew where it started. And you knew where the next would come, and then where the next. So once it passed you, you were perfectly... And the kids knew the routine. They would be out playing in the street. When the shelling would start, oh, have to wait until it passes them, and then they can go out and play for another half hour. So I got to the office, I delivered the mail, and uh, I gave them my chizbat about the, the trip. A week later, I find a note from Agronsky. It had come from Tel Aviv. It says, Mazal Tov on making yourself, on appointing yourself war correspondent. Keep up the good work. But it was too late. I was, I was back here already. So that was the end of that. Um, you remember the, I wanted to ask you about the uh, part of the struggle with the British. With, uh, with the Etzel and Lechi, with the uh, Ole Gardom, the story with the sergeants. Well, my contact with the British here was mainly with my uh, Yedidim and uh, with the censorship. They were totally unreasonable. There was a trial of some uh, Lechinik here in Jerusalem. The, the, the audience was packed. There was no problem with coverage until we wrote up the story. I get a notice from the censor. You can't publish the names of, of the witnesses or of the... Uh, the accused. I said, but that's ridiculous. It's, it was all in the open. Everybody knows who they are. So if everybody knows, you don't have to publish it. And we couldn't. Foreign correspondents could publish stuff in the foreign press, but not in the States. We could not quote from anything written by correspondents here uh, that was published in New York, even though it was already uh, common knowledge. But, you know, people are weird. Uh, I remember Izzy Stone, I.F. Stone, who was a great champion of Israel, a great Zionist. I remember one day at the PIO in Tel Aviv, uh, he was standing there. And Arthur Kessler came in with his bulldog. And uh, Kessler walks up to Izzy. And his, his approach then was, since there is a Jewish state, whoever wants to be Jewish lives in Israel. Whoever doesn't live in Israel doesn't have to be Jewish. And he starts pouring this out to, to Stone who was very hard of hearing. So Stern 
st turns off his hearing aid and says, I don't have to listen to that crap. <laughs> Walks away. But I mean, this is, this is the kind of weird reactions you got from people. All kinds of people in all different places. Did you feel like it, that you were, I mean, I, I, you know, on one hand, like looking back, you know, at 60 years ago, et cetera, but at the time, did you realize what you were, being, what you were part of, what kind of uh, history was going on, what? I was very excited about what I had been a part of. And uh, I had no real understanding of what the future would be. But then, you know, who has? I remember thinking that from now on it's going to be very dull. No. You know the Chinese curse? We're, we're the living embodiment of it. The, the only regret I have, and it's a, a monster, is that I ever left. If I had stayed, I'd now be retired from the post. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, of course, I, I, I reassure myself. On the other hand, if I hadn't, le if I hadn't left, I would never have met my wife. But you know, that doesn't hold true either. Uh, any kind of combination is possible, any kind of coincidence. I mean, I remember she was offered a job to teach at the dental college here. They said the first year you can teach in English, but then after that it has to be in Hebrew. Well, she had a great ear for music, but a tin ear for language. And we struggled. We worked on her Hebrew. It got nowhere. So that went down the drain. She retired in 2000. But in the, in the last year or two before that, she was working one, two days a week. She would leave the house at 5 o'clock in the morning. And it was always the same bus with the same people. And they were uh, a chever, you know, it was, it was very nice. But uh, that's what happens. Um, how do you think that having been a part of um, both, having been here when you were 13, 14, and then having been here during that period when you were with the Post, impacted on the rest of your life, on your children, on... Oh, well, my son made Aliyah. Um, my daughter was... She came for the bat and the bar mitzvahs of my son's kids and the weddings, but uh, she was already so uh, fixed in her job in the States that uh, she stayed. Uh, I, I think that my, my being what I am goes back to my father. I remember he had a, a buddy in Russia, Ted Zayn Miller, Tuvia, who incidentally had the biggest library of psychiatric work in, it, in, the, in the Middle East. I have no idea why. I know they sn tried to sneak across the border out of Russia. First time they got caught, they were sent back to their hometown every night in a different jail. The second time they made it, uh, they got to New York. Father stayed. Miller came on to Palestine. 
he ended up with a beautiful pardes in Rehovot with a huge well. During the, the uh, Second World War, his son was stationed in Cairo with the British. And he used to smuggle weapons across the border into Palestine, bring them up to Rehovot, then hide them in the well. When the war was over, and our war began, those weapons went to the Haganah. Uh, I remember we, we bought some land uh, south of Rehovot on the other side of the main road, right on the road. And uh, it was years, this was in 36, it was years before we got the Kushan. It was after the state was declared. So uh, when Danny came, I had him uh, talk to a lawyer about it. We could get control of the land if we pay the taxes from 1936, we didn't even have the Kushan then. Plus the, another minor complication, it was uh, <laughs> part of an army base. <laughs> so okay, we wrote that off, that's finished. Uh, but you know, it's part of the if only. I was... Uh, Schmoosing with, we became very friendly, my wife and I, with Aviezer Golan from Yediot Achronot. He came to New York as a, uh, a correspondent for Yediot, and his wife was a sculptor. So she went up to the sculpture center where my wife was working. Those are two of her pieces. And she did about 25, which I distributed before I left. Some went to museums, some went to friends. My son took one, my daughter took two. Anyway, this woman shows up uh, from Israel. So they immediately bonded. And we, we spent a lot of time together. And I remember one day, uh, Avi saying, you know, we all have these moments. If I had done so and so, I'd be a multimillionaire now. My mother wanted to buy a house on Riverside Drive. Two stories. In those days, it was, you could almost give it away. Not quite. My father said, nah, who needs it? Uh, that was the end of it. If she had been able to buy it, you know, the old story. So you can't cry over, uh, not over spilt milk, but milk that you didn't even buy. So. Um, I want to ask you a couple questions, I'm, I'm sure. That one question is, what it was like to practice journalism at a time when you were also in the Haganah? <laughs> yeah. You know, how, how, that, how that worked out, how you, know, how you felt like, you know, on one hand, the, the, uh, the idea of the, of the non-political nature of uh, the press and the freedom yeah. of the press, et cetera. On the other hand, clearly, you were in pursuit of, of a certain mission. Uh, oh, yeah. So. Well, you know, it was a, <clears throat> it was a full-time life. Everything but journalism during the day. And at night, it was, it was on the post. Uh, I only discovered a few years ago that Marlon Levin had been on Eisenhower's staff as a, uh, a code expert 
in World War II. And he came here, he was, they discovered him quickly enough, and he was doing it here. I had no idea. I'd see him during the, uh, at night, but never during the day. And there was that, that isolation all over the place. People you knew. Yeah, Tsipi Borovsky, I didn't, I had no idea, I, I thought you were just doing uh, nursing. If I had thought about it, it would have been obviously that she had to be in the Haganah. Everybody else was. Did Agronsky know? Did it matter? Did it? One day I said to Agronsky, I want to take a week off. He looks at me, you want or you need? I said, okay, I need. He said, all right, just be careful. He knew what it was. I was going to Ramat Rachel for training. I mean, there was no question about what people were doing, most people. But I had a funny thing. I was walking down the street the day after I got to Jerusalem, and I meet a woman who had lived in the same building with me in 1936 in, in Kerem Avraham. I said, oh, Frau Zulzbacher. And she stalked off. So I got hold of a fellow I knew from then, who was at this point a big shot in the Jerusalem Haganah. I said to him, what's with Zulzbacher? He said, we discovered that her husband was a spy for the British. So she left him and she changed her name back to her maiden name and that's the end of it. And, and I had to think about it because at one point, you know, we were the last house in the street. So it was a Haganah post. One day the British showed up. They're looking for Haganah members. And this was only 36, you remember. But as it happens, we had a spy with the British. And we knew they were coming. So all of Achevra had evacuated the, the post. And they weren't there when the British showed up. But uh, that's the way it goes. You, you never know. In, in your time, uh, I'm sure you met, you know, from your role in the post, I'm sure you met all kinds of people. I was also, uh, maybe I'll throw out a couple names just to see if, uh, you know, you had mentioned Chaim Weitzman before. Yeah. You had a chance to, to meet him? Not, no, just to meet. I never had a chance to talk to him. But my friend Maurice Samuel did Weitzman's autobiography. Um, Abba Eben? Yes. He was strange, you know. I don't remember why or what the circumstances were but I was at a meeting, something in New York, uh, in the States anyway, where he was the speaker. And I was sitting at the head table. This man gets up. The words just flow. He looks in complete control of himself and of the situation. And behind the table, his fingers are going like this. How do you see the two things together? This, this tremendous nervousness and the, the ease of delivery in there. Show me again, he was there. Hmm? Please show me again that he's back here. Ah, he's there. Okay. Um, 
Menachem Begin, at the time he was in hiding, so you... I heard him. I was down at Kikert Zion one day, and he was up on the balcony of the hotel. I can't think of the name of the hotel now. Europa? No. Whatever it was. And there were four guys with stun guns in each corner of the, of the Kikar. And he came out and spoke. I have never heard anything like it in my life. He was a spellbinder. It was a magnificent thing. I, in those days, I disagreed with everything he had to say, but boy, he said it so well. It was incredible. Of course, I mentioned, now that I'm, I'm living here, it's in this whole area that's all, with all the names of all, of Eitzel and Lechi and the, the whole gang. And I'll tell you something else. I've read a lot about him and by him, and I don't know of a politician or a political figure today who would do what he did when it came to the Alta Lena and the Eitzel wanted to attack the Haganah as a reprisal, and he said, Jews don't shoot Jews. He wouldn't permit it. I mean, this is a level that we don't have anymore. And it's, it's sad. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this was fascinating. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And I uh, really appreciate all the time. I'm not through with you. This is Marlon Levin and Betty. They're at the Dior Mugan in uh, Betakerem. Okay. Number one. Number two, what I've left out, you'll find in there. Number three, Moshe Sachs, Zax, they called him, 49. Unfortunately, he passed away about a month ago. Although in the last uh, year or so, he, uh, he, he had lost it. Uh, he was awfully confused. This you can keep, but this I want back okay. because I don't have another copy. I was in Jerusalem. There was Kol HaMagin, uh, some from Arabic and some from the Hebrew. The Hebrew I translated into English. I, I made a note here so you know why I'm, I'm giving you this. And this can be part of the archive. I don't have to have it back. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. <laughs>